Good morning. morning. Great to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, You guys can open up your Bibles to the book of Galatians with me. We're going to be going through Galatians chapter 6. And uh, it's kind of neat for me because uh, though I've taught through books before, I've taught through the book of Exodus, I've taught through um, James and Corinthians and a few other books. Uh, This is the first book that I'll actually teach through um, from the pulpit, you know, from here with you guys. So it's kind of neat. And uh, I'm glad that it is the book of Galatians. And I would encourage you that if you haven't gone through the book before, that you would take the time to go through the book of Galatians on your own because it is such a neat book. Uh, It's a book that has touched many, many great men and women of God's lives. And uh, people like Martin, Martin Luther and Paul himself have been touched by the truths that are found within the book of Galatians. So it is a, it is a book that um, is the foundation for the believer's life, and it's a book that every believer should know from cover to cover, and uh, you should definitely know and be living by the truths found within it. Uh, if you have a chance, um, all of these studies are also up on the website, so you can actually go to our website, and you can filter out the, um, the studies uh, when you're looking for messages and stuff. You can actually filter it out to Galatians and you can hear the whole study on the whole book of Galatians if you'd like as well. So uh, I encourage you to do so. It's just, it's a book that has just truly touched me and, uh, and hopefully you guys will be blessed as well as we get into chapter six here. All right, is everyone there? No? We used to in youth, they used to make a snap. I want you to snap if you're there. There you go, see, you guys are good at this. All right, wake you guys up. All right, chapter six, we'll go ahead and read a little bit here and then we will uh, we'll go ahead and start in some prayer. Let's read verse one. It says, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Verse 4. But let each one examine his own work, and when he will have re- re- uh, when he, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let's read verse 6. Let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you, Lord, and God, we just uh, always, as usual, we start out with praise and honor, Father, and thanksgiving for gathering us here together as believers in Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father, that you are our God and that you're a loving, gracious God, a God that we can read about here in the book of Galatians and that can still minister to us even today, Lord, thousands of years after uh, these words were originally written. Father God, we just uh, ask, Lord, that as we get into and as we finish up the book of Galatians, that its words would just become alive to us and that it would be truth within our lives. And Father, I pray, Lord, that if anyone in here is struggling with the, uh, with the things that Galatians speaks about, with the things that we will be reading about in chapter six, Lord, I pray that you would uh, just touch us now, Father, and just reveal yourself to us through these words, Lord. That God, our hope and our lives would be based on grace, Father, and grace alone. Lord, we thank you, God, again, and we just pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Galatians. The book of Galatians, you know, if you're not familiar with it, just to uh, give you a little bit on it, uh, was written to those in Galatia because they were running away or they were leaving their faith through grace in the Lord. And and, uh, they basically had come to Christ through grace alone, through believing that salvation is through the cross and through Jesus Christ and through nothing else other than that. And they were being persuaded by men that uh, though Jesus had saved them from their sins, though Jesus had went to the cross, though Jesus had had raised from the dead, uh, that there was still more that had to be done in a believer's life. And they were being taught that, uh, that though they'd accepted Christ, they had to be or they had to follow the laws and the traditions of, of the Jewish religion. 
They had to be circumcised. They had to follow the feast. They had to follow the Jewish law. And Paul is writing here to the church in Galatia to remind them of who they are in and through Christ alone. And that everything that they have is in Jesus Christ. That everything else comes second. And that nothing else will uh, determine or affect their salvation in absolutely any way. And I think that this hope and this truth that we find in Galatians, I think you can agree with me, is still true and still needed to be spoken today more than ever before. Because the world is definitely blind, amen? amen. They, uh, uh, they will uh, desire to go back to the same struggles and the same things that those in the church of Galatia were struggling with. It's the same lie from the same devil. And this is what we read here in chapter six, that we are not to focus on works. We're not to focus on the tangible things. All of those things do come through Jesus Christ and through living a righteous life and and a right life before God. Those things will come naturally through the Lord. So it's not that we will not have works. We will, but they will come naturally through the Lord. Uh, But also that we will not and should not leave uh, the spiritual for the physical. That we should Keep our hope in Jesus Christ and in God through his truth. Let's read again in verse one. It says, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So Paul specifically is speaking to the believer again there in Galatia that has left the things of the spirit, that have left, ha, have left the things of God and have now uh, put all of their trust into the flesh. And when you do that, when you put your trust into the flesh, what happens is you get fleshly things that come out, right? When you, when you sow, as we read, and we're going to read that when you sow to the flesh, you will reap of the flesh. And, and here in verse one, Paul says, he's speaking again to the believer that is overtaken by the trespasses. What trespasses is Paul speaking of? Well, if we go a little bit back in his letter, because remember in his letter, he did not have chapters or verses. Verses. But if you go a, a few sentences back, the Galatian would have read verse 19, speaking of those that were, uh, that were, sp- that, that were uh, basically doing the works of the flesh. And he says that those works are evident. He says that those which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, and you get the point. Uh, those that have left the fruits of the Spirit, those things that are found in verse 22, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the faithfulness, the goodness, the self-control, and the gentleness. These are the things that Paul speaks of for the believer that is walking according to to the spirit and i've said it before that how will you know if you are walking in the spirit or if you are walking in the flesh well you'll go back to chapter five in the book of galatians and you will see what my actions are are my actions that of wrath are my actions that of anger are my actions that of of uh, of lewdness and if they are then you know that you are walking according to the flesh that you are in the works but are my actions those of joy and love and peace and long suffering and are these the things that come out of them well then you will know that you are walking according to the spirit and paul encourages the believer that is being overtaken by the trespasses he says there in verse 1 he says you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness considering yourself lest you also be tempted right and it's neat because, um, because we all struggle <laughs> at times, right, with the works of the flesh. I don't think you can say that, well, I'm a believer now, so I never struggle with the works of the flesh. I never deal with these and things found in verse 19, ill, you know. No, we would never say something like that because at times in our lives, we all deal with things of the sort. And, uh, and it's neat because Paul doesn't say, well, for those that are found in the trespasses, he doesn't say those who are spiritual, kick them out of the church, right? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, tell everyone about their struggles so that we can pray for them, you know? He doesn't say, never talk to them again so that you won't be influenced by their wickedness. 
Pretend like nothing's wrong so that you won't offend them. No. The thing that he says is so beautiful. He says, restore. Restore such a one in a spirit of what? Of gentleness. Of gentleness. And that spirit of gentleness can mean many different things. In fact, I love how how, uh, Paul is not very specific here even. He just says, do it in gentleness is what he says. You know, it kind of reminds me of uh, when I'm laying down at home, maybe watching TV or something, and Luke comes into the room, and, uh, and we call Luke our little sour patch kid, because first he's sour, and then he's sweet, and he'll come over, and he'll start to hit me in the head, you know, with whatever's in his hand, and what, what, what do I do? I say, Luke, gentle, gentle Luke, and then Luke pets me, right? He says, okay, dad, you know, he gives me a couple pets and stuff, you know. And this is what God says. Sometimes we grab our Bible and we just want to just uh, smack somebody with it, right? We just want to smack that righteousness into someone and just go, wake up. Wake up from the works of the flesh. Wake up from what you're doing. Get back into the spirit. And what does God say? God says, gentle. God says, be gentle. Restore such a one. And that's the beautiful thing is that God always has a heart of restoration. He always wants to restore us. He always wants to bring us back. And I'll tell you what, there's weeks where I, that I have that I feel like God is restoring me every single day. Okay, Lord, I know you restored me yesterday, but today's a whole new day and I need that restoration all over again. You know, it's that constant thing that God is just continually doing a work in our lives. And I love the fact, again, that he says, do it with gentleness, continuing to walk in the spirit, right? Continuing to express and to show the fruits of the Spirit that we find there in Galatians 5. Verse 2 says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ, and how do we bear one another's burdens, or how does bearing one another's burdens fulfill the law of Christ? If you note down Matthew uh, Matthew 22, 36 through 40, you can read it later, but it says this. It says, teacher, which is the great commandment? As the Pharisees came to Jesus, they asked him, teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And Jesus answered and said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. What is the law of Christ? The law of Christ is to love, is to love. They asked him, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Well, Jesus said all of the commandments, they all hang on first loving your God, first putting God first in your life with your heart, mind, and soul. And then the second is like it, he said, right? He said to love your neighbor as yourself to love your neighbor as yourself. And, you know, how does bearing one another's burdens fulfill the law of Christ? Well, how better way to love one another than to bear one another's burdens, right? You know, we as believers should be there for one another more than the world is there for one another. You know, shame on us when the world is more loving than us, when the world is more gracious than us, when the world is more kind than us. You know, as we go through things in this life, we begin to learn how to sympathize and empathize with people, right? The more that we go through the things that we've been through in life, it really allows us when somebody else is going through the same thing, uh, it's that time that God has built that character within us that allows us to go to them and not necessarily, you know, pound scripture into them or, you know, hey, just, you know, suck it up, you know, type of thing. But it really allows us to say, man, I know what you're going through. I've been there. I've experienced that. And a lot of times it's not even about what we say, but it's just about being there for somebody, right? To listen, just to be that shoulder for them to lay on and just to cry and and us just to pray for them. You know, and and again, Paul said to restore them in that gentleness, and he said also to bear one another's burdens. 
you know, sometimes it's, it's easier to love someone than it is to like someone, right? You ever hear that? Like, I love you, but I just don't like you very much. But really, how is that loving at all? How can we love someone without liking them? We really can't. I love you, but I'll be okay if I never see you again. <laughs> you know, it's like, no. No, Paul said to bear their burdens with them. Paul said to be there. What does that mean to bear someone's burdens? Gosh, to have that weight put upon you, to mourn with somebody, to cry with them, to allow the things that they are going through to affect you so much that it's affecting you the same way that it has affected them. Verse three, read with me. It says, for if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. And what Paul is saying here is he's saying that I've been there too, really. He's saying I've gone through that, I've been there, we've messed up. And again, speaking to the one that needs the restoration, speaking to the one that has fallen within the trespasses. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You've heard that, you know, when we tell a lie long enough, we start to believe it ourselves, right? And Paul's simply saying that, man, I, I've messed up just like you've messed up. I've sinned just as you've sinned. You know, Paul called himself the chief of sinners, right? He said, man, if anyone, it was me. I'm the, I'm the chief. I'm the worst of the worst says, I don't think I'm anything. But he tells us to examine our own works. He says, rather than looking with that heart of criticism, because a lot of times we do that, you know, we want to rate Christians, right? You go, oh, that one's a six and that one's a two, you know, and they're like, you know, and if they're here a little longer, they might move up to a three or four, you know, put in some more time. But Paul says, examine, examine your own work. And then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. You know, as believers in Jesus Christ, we want to make sure that we don't adopt that self-righteous attitude, that attitude of criticism where we're constantly going and looking around with just that condemnation and that judgment. We want to make sure that within the judgment, because there is judgment between right and wrong, and, and that is definitely biblical, but we want to make sure that it's done God's way. Amen. We want to make sure that it's done with that spirit of gentleness, that it's done with the grace of God. Verse three, I'll read it again. It says, if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. What is needed? What's truly needed is humility. Humility is what's needed. Humility, so that we can relate to and be ministered to and minister to others is what we need as believers. Humility drops the walls. Humility allows us to receive from somebody else. We want to pretend like we have it all together and oh no, I'm fine and don't worry about me and you know, moms are great at that, right? You know, but it's humility that allows us to say, no, you know what? I do need prayer. Yeah, yeah, I do need some help right now. Yeah, I, I do need someone to be there for me and, and I would love to be able to just tell you what's going on. But it's also humility that allows us to teach others as well. It's that humility that allows us to be honest with people, right? As Paul is being honest here and just say, look, I've, I've been there. Yeah, you wanna know my testimony? Oh my gosh. You wanna know the things that I've gone through? Wow. And we drop that wall and that humility allows us again to share and to be honest with others. Verse six says, let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Now, as somebody is restored, as somebody is being restored, what are they, what's happening? They're being taught the word, right? They're being taught the word of God. And Paul says that anyone who is being taught the word of God, he says needs to share in all good things with him who teaches. You know, humility will allow a person that is being restored or being taught to receive or partake of the blessings 
the good things that have been found in the teacher's lives, right? This is what God has done in my life. This is what the work that the Lord has done in me. This is the restoration that has, that has come to me. So let me now share that with you, the blessings that you are giving out to others. And what is Paul saying? Paul's also saying, likewise, let the one that is receiving to also share in all good things with the one that is doing the teaching. You know, and you can look at this financially and Paul very well, you know, may have meant this or means it in in one way or another financially, he really does. And that as one is being taught and as one is, uh, has a job and is able to go work and as they are receiving from the blessings of church and from a pastor and from ministry, that they are to give back to the work of the Lord. And a part of that work of the Lord is by providing, as you read in the Old Testament, for the priests, right? For the Levites, for the pastors nowadays. And in doing so, what happens is in return, we end up getting back the benefit of our giving, right? We really do. And I'll tell you what, being a a pastor now and more involved in ministry, I really see the importance of this so much more than I ever have. How important it is for us to give back to those within the ministry. Uh, How amazing it would be to have somebody on staff for worship even. To have a worship pastor. You know a lot of churches have worship pastors. And you know what it does is it allows them, this is what it does. It allows them with the time that they normally would spend going to a job, putting the time and the effort into the things of the world, It allows them to take that time and to put it into the things of God. It allows them to just, you know, submerge themselves into the word of God, to dive into the scriptures, to get poured into and to know, and even for a worship pastor, to know, to know what worship is all about, to stand up here and not just sing songs, but to teach the body of Christ to worship, how to worship. This is what we should be desiring as a church. And again, as giving back to the church, as Paul said, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Again, in giving, all that happens is we just get to receive back even more, right? That's what happens. But I also love how Paul didn't use that word financially. He didn't say give of your finances. He didn't say give of your money because that's not all that Paul meant. That's all, not all that he was talking about. I believe that he meant a lot more than that as well. You know, you could also look at that as just sharing in pretty much the blessings of life. You know, all the blessings that we have to share in those things. You know, the good times, the times with family, the times with fellowship, the times eating, you know, the the scripture insight. How awesome it is to teach somebody and to receive back from them some good things. You just get so blessed. How neat it is to you know, invite somebody to your house and just say, hey, I just want you to partake of the good things, all the good things that I'm experiencing with my family. Come over for dinner. Hey, can I buy you that meal? Can we go out and and can I provide that meal for you? Hey, can I give you a ride? You know, hey, can I, you know, I have these clothes that I'm just gonna get rid of. You know, could anyone in your family use them? You know, all good things could mean so much And I think it really encompasses just so much more than even just our pocketbook. I like how Paul said that, in all good things. You know, what I do know is that Paul wants us to get rid of that spirit of just stinginess, right? My, my, my. Everything's mine. No, this is mine. You know, can you give, I give a little bit. You know, you get this little, you know, piece right here is for you, Lord, and the rest of it is, is mine. You know, my, you know, my money, my ministry, my house, my family. You know, everything, we, we put that word my before it. It's one of the first things our children learn, right? That's my toy, and you're not going to play with it. And you know what? Sometimes as adults, we never lose that. We go, no, that's my, you know, vehicle, you know how many times I have just been blessed by people donating their vehicle to the winter retreat, the youth winter retreat, and just saying, hey, here's the keys. Take, your, take our car and just go pack it out with kids. You know, have fun. Why? Because they see the importance and the value to these kids getting up that hill no matter what it takes. If it costs me my car for the weekend, that's fine. It's yours. 
how many times I've been blessed by people throwing us the keys and saying, yeah, go ahead, take it to Mexico, fill it with clothes, fill it with Christmas shoe boxes, just bring it back running, you know, as long as it comes back running. And sometimes we've brought it back barely running, you know, and I just say, Lord, forgive me, you know, before I give it back to him. Paul says, share in all good things. Sometimes we put the value on the tangible things rather than putting the value on what we could get by just giving it away to the Lord. How much it could affect somebody's life. Psalms 24, one says, the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and all those who dwell therein. Everything is the Lord's, you guys. Everything you have. You know, some of us struggle to give 10% to the Lord. Honestly, it's all his anyways. 100% of it is his. He's just allowing you to use it. I love that last song Jesse and the, and the guy sang. He said that, uh, I'm going to butcher it, but he said that, that the Lord was borrowing the grave for three days. The Lord was borrowing. It was, he was just using it, and it's like, man, this is just mine. This is my grave anyways. I'm going to use it for what I see fit, and when I'm done with it, then you can have it back. And that's the same thing with our stuff. We need to just give it to the Lord. Lord, it's yours. Use it as you f- see fit. And whenever you're done, if you allow me to use it a little bit, I'll be blessed. Verse six, let's read on. It says, let him who is taught, we read that already. Let's read verse, uh, verse seven. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. There will be consequences for our actions. That we can be sure of. Yes, we restore. And yes, we restore with grace and with mercy and with humility, and yes, we share in all good things. And again, this chapter is speaking of those that, that have broken, you know, the, the, the spirit of grace and the, and the spirit of, of uh, the, the fruits of the spirit. Yes, we are to restore them. But it doesn't mean that they will get away or that we will get away with evil. You know, sometimes we think, well, someone just needs to correct them. Someone just needs to just let them know that everything they're doing is just wrong, you know? They're folding the laundry wrong. They're washing the dishes wrong, you know? And we want to just correct everything in their life. Paul says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Is he the judge of all or are we the judge of all, you know? Is he the one that's bringing righteousness or are we the one that's bringing righteousness? Sometimes we think that we have to protect God and that we have to defend God. And we don't want God to be mocked. And that's fine. That's a good heart to have, you know, that we want to protect our God. But honestly, he doesn't need your protection. Spurgeon said, how do you defend the word of God? He said, like a lion, you let it out of its cage. (laughs) You know, that's what you do. That's how you defend a lion. And that's how you defend the word of God. You just allow it to be what it is. He says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. You know, we get people that come here to this church and, and you know, they, they desire to be restored. I, 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 I truly believe that they have that desire at times to be restored, to experience God's grace, to experience God's forgiveness. And unfortunately, most often than not, a lot of people that come forward and get prayer for, and ask for forgiveness, and accept the Lord, and recommit their lives. Unfortunately, a lot of times, you know what happens is we never see them again after that day. You know, they come forward, and they kind of have that moment, and they feel really good about themselves, and then they just kind of walk out the door, and they go, hey, I'm better. You know, I'm I'm, I'm good, and they go back, and they just kind of live their life the way that, that they, you know, came in living, and what Paul's saying here is that really that's not how it works. It's not about just asking for forgiveness and then going on and living your lives again. Why? Because God will not be mocked in your life. Because one day that judgment will come and in due season, those 
who will reap the benefits of God are those that do not lose heart, those that continue on in the word of God. But it's about seeking God fully with a whole heart. And again, sometimes we think that we have to shake that person a little bit, you know? Can I pray for you? Yeah, let me pray for you. But let me shake you at the same time a little, you know? Let me, let me share these scriptures with you and let's talk about, you know, what went on and why you're even here. You know, we don't ask them to lay out their whole, you know, life before us and, well, tell me, tell me what sins you're struggling with, you know, before we pray. You know, what's going on, my son, you know? And we don't get into all that. Honestly, they come here and we say, man, whatever you've done, it's okay. God is greater. God is stronger. And nothing that you've done in the past will ever be stronger than what God has done and what he's going to do in the future. And that's all that we do. And we just point them to Jesus. And really everything else is just getting in the way. And sometimes, you know what though? In our flesh, after the first person comes and goes, and the second person comes and goes, and the third, what happens is we get to that 10th person and we go, man, Lord, what's going on? I'm not gonna lose this one, Lord. This one I'm keeping here, you know, no matter what it takes. And we go, God, you won't be mocked, but you won't be mocked because by my hands, you know, and, and you know, pray for that 10th person because you don't want to be that 10th person to walk in because that's the one we just want to let have it, you know. It's like, oh, I'm gonna. No, Paul says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked, Galatian. Paul says, you continue to walk according to the spirit, Galatian. You continue to walk according to righteousness. You continue to restore with gentleness, with love, with long suffering. In verse eight, he says, for he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. If we do not lose heart. Verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And I love that, that he says, uh, whenever you have an opportunity, you know, God will give us those opportunities. And a lot of times it's just praying for it. And I encourage you guys, when you wake up, pray, God, give me an opportunity today to do good. And a lot of times it's God will be start to correct our thought process throughout the day and he'll allow us to see the opportunities when maybe we wouldn't have seen them regularly, you know, or without praying. But he says, let us do good to all. Let us do good to all. And, and I love it because we see a lot of good being done here in this church, right? And I love seeing you guys do good. When people are in need, when families are in need, you know, we see meals that are provided for when families are going through things. When babies are born, same thing. We have people at the church that provide meals for those families during that hard time. And it's just neat that Paul encourages us to do good to others. Why? Because doing good to others is, again, it's just that outward expression. It's just the love of Christ just coming out of us. But he makes a distinction here, and he kind of points it out in the end of the verse. He says, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And I like that. That first he encourages us to do good to all, to do good to the world, to do good to those non-believers and those in the world that we do not turn our backs on them, that we don't say, well, they're not a Christian, so I'm not going to help them out, you know, that we don't, you know, again, have that self-righteous attitude or anything. And No, Paul said, do good to all. He didn't put stipulations on it. But what he did do is he encourages us to be especially good to those that are in the church. And I like that. Because I need you to be there for me because one day you'll need me to be there for you. And vice versa. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. We can help the world all we want, you guys. But in a true time of need, it's the church that will be there for us. It's our brothers and sisters in the Lord that will have the truth and that will point us to Jesus. The world will not point us to Jesus. 
we will not get anything in return. It's our brothers and sisters in the Lord that we have to be there for. Why? Because in Ecclesiastes it says, woe to him who is alone. Woe to him that, that has nobody. Because when he falls, there'll be no one there to help him up. Well, Roman, I don't have that. Well, get it. Pray that God would give it to you. And don't just sit back and wait and say, Lord, bring that person to me that will help me in time of need. Because that's not how it works. Proverbs says that the man who has many friends is friendly. Go out and be that person to somebody else. And in return, God will give you those people back in your lives. You want somebody to provide meals for your family in time of need? Well, then provide meals for others in time of need. You want people that will give you a ride? Well, then give others a ride when they're in time of need. And help out in other ways in time of need, whatever good that you can do. And guess what? You will be blessed. You will be blessed when you fall because somebody else will be there to pick you up. Verse 11 says, see with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Paul, in the last half of his chapter here, in the last chapter, in the last part of his chapter, the book of Galatians, Galatians, he makes one final plea. One final plea. He says, see with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. And verse 12, he says, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul goes back to the basics. He goes right back to chapter one. And he says, Galatians, listen up. The world will want to dress you up. The world will want to make you look pretty. The world, all it cares about is its outward appearance. All it cares about is how it looks to the, to the world when really uh, leaving the things of the heart undealt with. And I think too many times, even as believers, sometimes that's what we want to do to one another. We want to dress each other up. We want to, you know, kind of clean each other up and go, hey, just, just come on Sundays, you know, so the pastor sees you. You know, is that what we tell our children sometimes? <laughs> you know, just kind of be there, you know. You know, just, just help out a little bit, you know, so everyone kind of sees it. Our family kind of does these things. But are we, are we dealing with the things of the heart? Are we really hitting the things that matter? You know, it's been said that you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig, right? <laughs> you can dress it up and you can make it look pretty, but it's still a pig. You know, and the same is true within our lives. You know, we can try to, you know, fix the outward appearance, the outer, our outer selves, our shell, really, our flesh, when never truly dealing with what's inside. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You know, we're so worried about getting to church on time. And then we zone out during the message, right? You ever do that? I do it. Let's volunteer for that ministry, you know, let's, you know, get involved when our relationship with the Lord is just in shambles. Isaiah says, woe to you, woe to you, great sorrow, great sorrow and distress is what that means to you. He's not hoping for it to come, he's just saying it is on its way. Because one day, everything that you've built up will one day fall because there's no foundation. Verse 15, it says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation, but a new creation. All the works we can do, all the outward appearance, you know, we could dress up. Everything that the world tries to, tries to just pressure on itself and that, that we try to, you know, make ourselves look that, you know, that we are, that we truly aren't. And just all these things, Paul says it avails nothing. 
But what avails? He says that new creation. You know, it just brings that this funny picture into my head of this caterpillar grabbing some twigs and a couple leaves and just trying to make some wings out of it, you know, and flapping as hard as it can, trying to take off, you know, and just wanting so hard to be a butterfly. You know, no matter how many, how hard it flaps its wings, you know, it's never going to be a butterfly, right? It's never going to take off. And that's what we do a lot of times as believers. We just go, let me do this in my own strength. I can do this, Lord. When really, what is it? It's that natural process that turns that caterpillar in that time of the cocoon into a beautiful butterfly. It's that new creation in the Lord in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And in that cocoon, in that time where God is restoring us, where he's doing a work, where he's breaking us down, where he's destroying everything, all of our thoughts and all everything that we are, it's in that time that he will build us right back up. But he'll build us up into his creation. He'll build us up into something beautiful. In ending, read with me 16 through 18. It says, and as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. For now on, let no one trouble me. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ, be with your spirit, amen, amen. And what is Paul saying here? He says, upon the Israel of God, peace and mercy will be upon you. That word Israel just means governed by God. Those that are governed by God, those that are no longer working according to the flesh, those that are no longer living according to their own desires, those that are living according to the spirit, those that have joy, those that have peace, those that have long suffering and patience. He says, peace and mercy be upon you. And isn't that true? We will receive peace and mercy as we just walk in the joy of the Lord. Paul says, from now on, let no one trouble me for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord. I just love how Paul ends the book of Galatians. He says that God has affected me so much. God has touched me so deeply that his marks are upon me, that it's visible, it's evident. You cannot look at me and not see Jesus. You cannot look at me and not see the marks of God. Because Jesus' marks are upon my body. Has Jesus touched you? Has he affected you in a way that when others see you, they won't be surprised when they see you sitting next to them at church? You ever do that when someone's sitting next to you? Hey, what are you doing here? Don't ever say that to someone at church. They might say it right back, you know. Paul said, I bear in my body, the marks of the Lord Jesus. In verse one, I'll leave you with this. In verse one of Galatians, I said originally teaching through that chapter that you could sum up the whole book or the whole reason for Paul writing the book in verse six. In verse six says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of God to a different gospel. Do not turn away from God's grace. Do not turn away from his peace and his mercy and the truths that you have found in the Lord. Paul was amazed that the Galatians could have gold and turn it in for coal. That they could have something so valuable, so amazing, so, so freeing. And yet they would give it all up for the chains and the bondage of works. Let's put everyone back in these shackles, you know. Second Corinthians 12, 9 says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It's in our infirmities. It's in our weaknesses. In our weaknesses, 
when we want to give up, when we want to just, you know, just start to do things by the flesh and by our own means, that Paul said that his grace is sufficient for us. Boast in those weaknesses. Boast in those times where, where we have doubt. Boast in those times where we're human. Because it's in those times that Christ wants to come in and just fill all the gaps. And he just wants to fill all the need. And it's in that time that God wants to build character in us. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for the truth that we find within the book of Galatians. God, I thank you, Father, that, Lord, though we try so many times to do things by the flesh, though we try so many times, Lord, to uh, just to flee, even from your, the simplicity of the gospel, Lord, the simplicity of salvation and forgiveness, God. Lord, that you have done things like written the book of Galatians. You have done things, Father, like given us those brothers and sisters in you that can remind us, that can just point us to Jesus. Lord, let us never look to works, Father. Let us never look to the things of our hands. Let us never look, God, to the things of the flesh, Father. As Paul said, if you sow to the flesh, well, you will reap of the flesh. And the things that you will reap is destruction. Father, we pray, Lord, that today that we would sow to the things of the Spirit. Father, that we would just reap of the things of the Spirit, Lord. The fruits of the Spirit, God, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the gentleness, Father. All of the good things, God, that you have, that you so desire to just share with us, your children. If we, being evil, know how to give good gifts, how much more, our Father in heaven, Father, I pray right now, Lord, that if anyone is struggling with the doctrine of grace, if anyone is struggling with gentleness, with freedom, if they feel like they're in bondage and, and they just are just looking for all the answers apart from you, Lord, I pray, God, for those walls just to be broken down right now, Father. And we pray just in unity, God, that you would just lift our brother or our sister up and God, that you would give them hope, Father. That you would restore their spirit, Lord. And God, that we would just do it in gentleness, Father. We thank you, Lord, for this day, God. We thank you for all your goodness. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.